My name is Delphine Brody. My pronouns are she, her, and uh, welcome to our session. Um, I'm a member of the organizing team for Imagining Abolition and the moderator of this session. And I want to make you aware that um, closed captioning is available. So to view a live transcription, uh, click the live transcript button on the bottom menu and select show subtitle. Also, in order to secure the space, uh, you cannot rename yourself once you've entered. Uh, we're sorry if this um, causes any difficulties, um, if you're unable to add, add your pronouns to your name already, um, but we urge you to do so uh, before you log into the next session. And um, you may also uh, share your pronouns if you use those um, in the chat during this session. So I wanna offer a brief land acknowledgement uh, we are gathered here today on Indigenous land, um, here on Turtle Island uh, in, in the North American continent. Um, this land has, has been stolen from the original stewards uh, through conquest, uh, colonization, and genocide. And uh, I'm joining you from unceded, occupied Ohlone territory in uh, the, on the, the site of the village Huichin, um, which is also known as Oakland, California. Um, so each of us has a relationship with the land that we're on and the original stewards of that land. Um, and that, that relationship is informed by our ancestry and our present day experiences. Um, we may have ancestors who are indigenous to this land and or ancestors who were brought here um, as enslaved peoples. Um, and we may also have uh, ancestors uh, who came here as colonizers um, and had a direct role in the settler colonization of the land we're on. So uh, each of us has, has a, a responsibility and a right to, to um, understand um, that ancestry and, and how we can work to decolonize and, and, and the genocide against indigenous peoples. Um, in dreaming of this event, our team was inspired by words adapted by Project NIA. Abolitionist futures are not compatible with white supremacy, settler colonization, misogyny, heterosexism, transphobia, ableism, and classism. Yet these systems of oppression are all around us and affect even this event space. The hope our team has for this session is that organizers, presenters, participants, particularly those of us who carry a lot of privilege, are mindful of the differential impacts of power and have the courage to hold to account anyone here who exercises power in ways that enact harm. If one of our organizers removes you from this session, our intention is not to punish nor to exclude you, but rather to practice care for the abolitionist community that we're building. And you can share your comments. Um, there's, there's a link for, for feedback that I'll, I'll post in the chat momentarily uh, where you can, you can share your critical feedback about the session and about our conference. Um, when you are, um, posting on social media, and we encourage you to do so, please use the hashtag Imagining Abolition 2021. That's hashtag Imagining Abolition 2021 for Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Um, so I want to welcome our presenters for today. So I wanna welcome Seema Azad and SM Rodriguez. So, Sima Azad uh, is a freelance journalist and political activist based in Uttar Pradesh, India. She runs her own news magazine called Dastak Naye Samai Ki, The Dawn of a New Era, and is associated with civil and democratic rights organization, PUCL, the People's Union for Civil Liberties. She and her partner Vishwa Vijay were imprisoned in 2010 under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. 
or allegedly being Maoists. They spent 2.5 years in prison and their trial is still going on. Seema has written her jail diary, Zindanama, and her other publications are Surrogate Country and Aurat Ka Safar Jail Se Jail Tak, Women's Journey from Prison to Prison. Translator Shailsa Sharma is a PhD student enrolled at University of Exeter. She is a qualified lawyer and an activist based in India. Shailsa is also the co-founder of online platform Detention Solidarity Network, which is an online space to critically engage with the structures and experiences of detention that constitute the carceral state in India. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me for this conference. Uh, I will speak in uh, English and my friend Shailja will translate it into English. So, as I told you in my introduction, I was in the charge of Maoist in jail and because I am a lawyer, I am a human rights activist, so I have to make a human rights activist in jail a human rights activist and a lawyer in the form of a human rights फिर उसको अपनी डायरी में जिस डायरी का जिक्र किया उसमें मैंने लिखा तो और उसका जो अभी दूसरा जेल डायरी मेरा आया है उसमें उस पे फोकस होके मैं आज अपनी बात रखना चाहती हूँ क्योंकि वो उस पे फोकस है कि जो भारत की जेलों में जो औरतें जेल में हैं वो ज़्यादातर ऐसी ऐसे अपराध के कारण से ज कि वो यहाँ पे जो पेट्रियार्कल सिस्टम है उसकी वजह से वो जेल में है तो वो पूरा उसका जिस्ट है उसमें और उसी पे फोकस करके आज मैं अपनी बात भी रखना चाहती हूँ इस किताब में पूरा जेल का ही मतलब जेल में गई हुई औरतों का वर्णन है लेकिन किसी भी देश में लोकतंत्र की कैसी स्थिति होती है ये देखने के लिए उस देश की जेल को देखना चाहिए जेल हर देश में चावल के उस दाने की तरह होता है जिसे देखकर पतीली में पक रहे पूरे चावल के बारे में पता लगाया जा सकता है इस संदर्भ में मुझे क्रांतिकारी कवि वरवर राव की यह बात बिल्कुल सटीक लगती है कि पूरी दुनिया ही एक जेल है और जेल उसका छोटा रूप है लेकिन जब हम भारत के सामंती पित्र सत्तात्मक समाज व्यवस्था महिला और महिला जेल की बात करते हैं तो वरवर राव की बात थोड़ा बदल कर यूं हो जाती है कि पूरी दुनिया एक जेल है जिसमें औरतें अलग अलग छोटी छोटी जेलों में कैद हैं जिसे हम घर कहते हैं और सत्ता की जेलें महिलाओं की छोटी छोटी जेलों से थोड़ी बड़ी सामूहिक जेल है इसलिए महिला जेल में अक्सर ये ट्रेजिक सीन देखने को मिल जाता है जब वे वहां मिलकर अपनी छोटी सी जेलों से आजादी को सेलिब्रेट करती है वे रोजाना के घरेलू कामों के रूटीन को ब्रेक करती हैं, एक दूसरे के साथ मिलकर गाती हैं, सजती सवरती हैं, हंसी ठिठोली करती हैं और अपने पति सास ससुर सभी को खुलकर गालियां भी देती हैं। लेकिन फिर भी वे सत्ता की इस बड़ी जेल से जल्द से जल्द रिहा होकर उस छोटी घरेलू जेल में जाने के लिए तीव्र इच्छा भी रखती है बेशक वे इन बड़ी जेलों में अपने पित्र सत्तात्मक घरों के कायदे कानून दमनात्मक रीति रिवाजों और वहां के जेलर की भूमिका में उपस्थित सामंती मुखिया से मुक्त होती हैं, लेकिन यहाँ इस जेल में वे घरों को संरक्षण देने वाली सत्ता की बनाई बनाई गई चार दीवारी में कैद होती हैं, जो कि अधिक यातनादायी होता है क्योंकि यहाँ दमन प्रत्यक्ष और अधिक क्रूर होता है इस तरह उनकी कभी रिहाई नहीं होती क्योंकि इनके पास को, कोई और विकल्प ही नहीं है जेलों में बंद इन औरतों का सफर वास्तव में एक जेल से दूसरे जेल तक का है इसीलिए मेरी दूसरी जेल डायरी का नाम यही है औरत का सफर जेल से जेल तक अपने ढाई साल के जीवन में मैंने इन औरतों के जीवन की दशा को जितना देखा जाना और समझा इस बात का एहसास बहुत ही शिद्दत के साथ हुआ कि इन औरतों के जेल आने की वजह भारत की सामंती और पित्र सत्तात्मक व्यवस्था है जिनसे निकलने की छटपटाहट में या तो उन औरतों से कोई अपराध हो गया या उसी मानसिकता के कारण उसे अपराधी करार दिया गया 
जेल में बंद ज्यादातर औरतें अपराधी नहीं हैं। उनकी सामाजिक आर्थिक स्थितियां कुछ ऐसी बनी कि उनसे वह घटना हो गई जिसे कानून में अपराध कहा जाता है कुछ ने गरीबी से तंग आकर जीने खाने के विकल्प के रूप में ऐसा काम चुना जिन्हें समाज अपराध मानता है कुछ ऐसे भी उदाहरण थे कि उनके पास और कोई विकल्प ही नहीं था कुछ ने अपनी परिस्थितियों से निकलने के लिए उन नैतिक मूल्यों को तोड़ा जो ऐसे समाज में औरतों पर जबरन थोपे जाते हैं और औरतें उन्हें बोझ समझते हुए भी ढूंढती रहती हैं। वह समाज जहां सामंती पित्र सत्ता है अंधविश्वास और पिछड़ापन है वहां ढेरों कानून इस समाज व्यवस्था को बनाए रखने के लिए बनाए जाते हैं फिर इन कानूनों को तोड़ना अपराध की श्रेणी में आता है एक दो उदाहरणों से अपनी बात करूं तो एक महिला को बच्चा नहीं हो रहा था जो भारत के सामंती समाज में महिलाओं का बहुत ही बड़ा दुर्गुण माना जाता है ऐसी महिला को अपमानित करने के लिए उसे बांझ कहा जाता है उस महिला को लोगों ने ज्यादातर लोगों से ज्यादातर ताने सुनने को मिल रहे थे पति की उपेक्षा इतनी बढ़ती गई कि वह उसे छोड़ दूसरी शादी करने की तैयारी करने लगा था सामंती समाज अनिवार्य रूप से पिछड़ा भी होता है महिला एक तांत्रिक के पास गई और तांत्रिक ने उसे एक बच्चे की बलि देने को कहा जिसके बाद उसे बच्चा हो जाएगा महिला ने अपनी जेठानी के बच्चे को तालाब में फेंक कर मार डाला और जेल आ गई उसने पुलिस से लेकर मजिस्ट्रेट तक को सारी बात सच सच बता दी फिर भी उसे 20 साल की सजा सुना दी गई इस पूरी न्यायिक प्रक्रिया में किसी ने भी एक बार भी समाज में पहले उस वैचारिक गंदगी के बारे में नहीं सोचा जिसके कारण वह महिला बच्चा पैदा करने के लिए कुछ भी करने को तैयार हो गई उसके बारे में सोचने के बाद भी क्या आप उस महिला को दी गई सजा को जायज ठहरा सकेंगे अपराधी वह महिला है या वह सामंती व्यवस्था जिसने उसे अपनी स्थिति से निकलने के लिए वह करने के लिए मजबूर किया जो उसे नहीं करना चाहिए एक महिला जिसका पति शादी के बाद लगभग एक साल बाद ही मर गया और उसके कुछ समय बाद उसके देवर से उसका संबंध बन गया जब यह बात गांव में फैलने लगी तो देवर की उस महिला से शादी करने के बजाय दूसरी लड़की से शादी कर दी गई क्योंकि भारतीय समाज में विधवा महिला का किसी पुरुष से संबंध अवैध माना जाता है लेकिन कुछ दिन बाद जब नवविवाहिता लड़की को उसके पति का उसकी भाभी से रिश्ते की बात पता चल गई तो लड़की ने खुद पर मिट्टी का तेल छिड़क कर आत्महत्या कर ली लड़की के घर वालों ने इसके लिए विधवा महिला और उसके देवर को जिम्मेदार मानते हुए उनके खिलाफ एफ दर्ज करा दी और दोनों जेल आ गए इसमें तीन लोगों के सीधे तौर पर और दोनों से जुड़े कितने लोगों की अप्रत्यक्ष तौर पर जिंदगी बर्बाद हुई पति की मौत के बाद देवर से प्रेम के कारण जेल आ जाने वाली महिला का दोष क्या है कौन है जिम्मेदार इसके लिए कुछ महिलाएं ऐसी मिली जेल में जो किसी लड़के से प्यार करती थी लेकिन भारतीय समाज में शादी जो कि माँ पिता की मर्जी से और जाति धर्म देख कर की जाती है इसलिए उनकी शादी प्रेम करने वाले से नहीं करके कहीं और कर दी गई बाद में जब पति को इसकी भनक लग गई कि उसकी पत्नी कहीं और प्यार करती थी तो पत्नी के रूप में महिला की पिटाई बढ़ गई किसी एक दिन औरत ने प्रतिरोध में पलट कर किसी भारी चीज से शराबी पति पर वार किया और उसकी मौत हो गई घर वालों ने एफ में लिखाया कि प्रेमी के साथ रहने के लिए पति ने पत्नी को मार डाला वो जेल आ गई क्योंकि उसने कभी प्रेम किया था जिससे उसे शादी नहीं करने दी गई एक महिला ऐसी भी थी जिसने अपने साथ बलात्कार की कोशिश में लगे एक आदमी का लिंक काट दिया और बदहवासी में घटना स्थल पर उपस्थित भीड़ को दिखाती रही पुलिस ने उसे गिरफ्तार कर लिया और जज ने उसे 20 साल की सजा सुना दी क्योंकि सड़कों पर फल बेचने वाली यह महिला पुरुषों के साथ दारू भी पीती थी और अपनी मर्जी होने पर उनसे संबंध भी बनाती थी यानी किसी सामंती समाज की नजर में वह पक्के तौर पर कैरेक्टरलेस थी आप बताइए वह महिला अपराधी है या यह न्याय व्यवस्था कुछ उदाहरण ऐसे ऐसी महिलाओं के हैं जिन्हें काम दिलाने के नाम पर वेश्यालयों में लाकर छोड़ दिया गया शुरुआती प्रतिरोध के बाद शर्मिंदगी में लड़कियों ने घर से रिश्ता खत्म करके उस दुनिया को अपना लिया लेकिन इस दुनिया का सत्ता से अलग तरह का संबंध है जिसमें पुलिस वालों से कभी कभी अनबन होती रहती है और वे जेल भेज दी जाती है इसी दुनिया के लोग उनकी जमानत कराते हैं फिर पैसा कमाने के लिए उनके शरीर को बाजार में झोंक देते हैं बल्कि मेरे रहते जब इनका एक समूह जेल आया तो एक और गरीब लड़की को अपने काम की ओर खींच ले गया कुछ औरतें जीविका के लिए काम ढूंढते हुए स्मैक और चरस बेचने वालों के संपर्क में आ गई और उनके साथ काम करने लगी फिर जेल आ गई इसके लिए दोषी कौन है कुंतला जिसका नशेड़ी पति जब जेल आया तो वो अपने बच्चों और सास के साथ इतमान से घर में थी 
बेशक उसे और उसके बच्चे को बाहर भी काम पर काम करना पड़ रहा था उसका पति जेल में बीमार हुआ उसे अस्पताल पहुंचाया गया और उसकी पत्नी होने के नाते कुंतला को बाध्य किया गया कि वो उसकी सेवा के लिए अस्पताल जाए क्योंकि पितृसत्तात्मक समाज में ये पति की सेवा करना हर पत्नी का परम कर्तव्य है उसका पति थोड़ा ठीक होते ही अस्पताल से भाग गया और उसे भगाने के आरोप में कुंतला को जेल भेज दिया गया कुंतला जैसी तो कई औरतें जेल में हैं जिन्होंने कोई अपराध किया ही नहीं फिर भी जेल में हैं लेकिन वे औरतें जिनके काम को अपराध कहा जा सकता है उनमें से किसी ने भी उसे सोच समझ कर योजनाबद्ध तरीके से नहीं किया जो अपराध माने जाने की आवश्यक शर्त होती है इन सभी ने जो किया वो उनके जीवन के बहाव का एक ऐसा हिस्सा था जिस पर उन स्थितियों में रहने वाला कोई भी इंसान पहुंच सकता है वह उन औरतों के सामंती पितृसत्तात्मक समाज और इस समाज के घरों में कैद होने की बेचैनी और उससे निकलने की छटपटाहट में की गई कार्रवाई थी जिससे अपराध करके उन्हें जेल में भेज दिया गया इन घटनाओं का ऊपरी कवच हटाकर अगर इनका अध्ययन करें तो हम देखेंगे कि अपराधी यह महिलाएं नहीं बल्कि वो समाज व्यवस्था है जिसने उन्हें वैसा करने की ओर ढकेला इस सामंती समाज ने ऐसे नैतिक मूल्यों को गढ़ा है जो महिलाओं को एक अदृश्य जेल में हमेशा कैद रखता है जब वो इससे निकलने का प्रयास करती हैं, तो उसे अपराध घोषित कर वास्तविक जेल में डाल दिया जाता है इन महिलाओं के कथित अपराधों पर न्यायाधीश जब अदालतों में फैसले सुनाते हैं तो वे समाज के तलछट के लोगों को अपराध की ओर ढकेलने वाली स्थितियों और समाज व्यवस्था पर एक शब्द भी नहीं कहते इसलिए जब वे सजा सुना रहे होते हैं तो वास्तव में खुद अपराध कर रहे होते हैं क्या अदालतों के लिए सोचने का विषय नहीं है कि शोषण पर टिकी व्यवस्था को चलाने वाले लोग अपराधी हैं या उस व्यवस्था में जीने को अभिशप्त लोग जेल बनाए रखने की बनाए जाने की अवधारणा पर सवाल उठाने वाली मानवाधिकार कार्यकर्ता एंजेला डेविस कहती हैं जेलें होनी ही नहीं चाहिए ये समाज के अपराध को कतई कम नहीं करती क्योंकि समाज व्यवस्था में अपराध को जन्म देने वाले अनेक कारण कारक मौजूद है इसलिए जब तक शोषणकारी समाज व्यवस्था बनी रहेगी अपराध होते रहेंगे क्योंकि जेलें शोषणकारी सामंती पितृसत्तात्मक वर्ण और वर्ग व्यवस्था द्वारा ही बनाई गई एक संस्था है इसलिए यह समाज की तलछट में पड़े अपराधी करार दिए गए लोगों के शोषण को और बढ़ाने का काम करती हैं। इसीलिए महिला जेलें भी औरतों के लिए घरेलू जेलें जेलों से सत्ता की जेलों तक का सफर है यह घरेलू कारक को तोड़ने वाली औरतों को सजा देने के लिए बनाई गई एक संस्था है थैंक यू Thank you, Seema ji. Um, thank you for everyone who patiently listened. I'm now going to translate this into English. All errors or oversights are in the translation, of course, mine. Um, so, as Seema was saying, she's a human rights activist and a journalist. And from this perspective, uh, she wrote her jail diary once uh, she came out of prison after spending two and a half years uh, in Nani Central Jail in Uttar Pradesh. So I'm now going to verbatim translate whatever she said. I have also recently published another book which narrates the stories of women in prison, the world of crime, and its direct links with the feudal patriarchal society th that we live in. According to me, to determine the state of a democracy of a country, one should examine the prisons of that country. Prison in a country is like that grain of rice which is taken out to verify the readiness of the rice in the pot. In this context, uh, an Indian revolutionary poet uh, by the name Varvar Rao has said, a prison facility is no more than a manifestation of the prison-like world we live in. In talking about women and women in prison in the feudal patriarchal society of India, Varva Rao's saying needs some alteration. This world is a large prison within which women are confined to my right smaller prisons, and these smaller prisons are called homes. Women's jails are only slightly bigger than many such familial or domestic jails. And occasionally in prison, one witnesses tragic scenes of women celebrating their independence from these domestic jails. In prison, uh, in prison, women disrupt their usual routine involving household chores, 
they sing along with each other they play dress up and apply makeup on each other laugh and joke together and openly insult their partners or parents in law in their absence nonetheless women retain a strong desire to be released from this big jail and retain and return to their smaller domestic jails of course in these big jails they are free from uh, the oppressive rules laws and customs of their patriarchal households and even the patriarch who plays the role uh, plays the role of the jailer but behind the four walls of the prison that are supposedly made for the protection quote and quote protection of these households women face increased oppression because in some ways the repression here is direct and more brutal in this way they are never really released from any oppressive system and that is why my newest book is actually called women's journey from one you know roughly translating from one jail to another in my two and a half years in prison i observed the condition of women's lives closely i came upon the realization that a tussle with the feudal and patriarchal systems in india forces women's entry into prison and in the struggle to confront these feudal patriarchal systems they either commit a crime or are declared criminals by or as a result of existing patriarchal structures in fact the existing legal setup and the stack of legislations um maintain the social order of this society which is riddled with feudal patriarchal conditions superstitions and backwardness in my observation most women uh, locked up in jail are not criminals i just want to pause here and just say in seema's speech in most spaces where she, in most places where she's uh, using the word crime she is actually uh, questioning the very definition or how we actually come to define the word crime so in my observation most women locked up in jail are not criminals their actions which have been deemed a crime in law were a direct result of their socio economic conditions some women's actions were a result of a conscious choice to create an alternative to living in extreme poverty while others had no option but to commit crimes as a matter of survival a few even had to break gendered expectations and dominant moral values inflicted upon them by society to commit these crimes let me cite a few examples a childless married woman in an indian society is a sinful woman in fact the colloquial usage of the word infertile is an abuse directed at women one woman who was unable to bear children was regularly being harassed and taunted by family and relatives her husband was ready to leave her and marry somebody else to reproduce there is no doubt that in a feudal society superstitions take hold quite easily and it is common for people to actually visit um, what is locally known as a tantric and the woman did visit a tantric and a tantric here is a reference uh, to an occultist it is usually someone who would please paltry sums of money from people under bogus claims of resolving their problems by using black magic or some other secret techniques now this tantric asked the woman to sacrifice a child after which she could have her have her own the woman drowned her sister in law's child into a pond and that is how she ended up uh, in prison she described this entire episode to everyone from the police to the magistrate yet she was sentenced to 20 years in prison in this entire judicial process no one gave a second thought to the ideological filth prevalent in our society which actually led her to take such extreme actions to again satisfy the gendered expectations of giving birth to a child if you were to really think about the circumstances of her crime would you be able to justify justify 20 years of confinement 
in this scenario is the woman a criminal or the existing feudal patriarchal system which compelled her to take such an action uh, the real criminal let me speak about another example there was a woman in prison whose husband passed away one year after their marriage shortly afterwards she became romantically involved with her brother in law when this detail began to be known in the village the brother in law was married off to another girl because it was unacceptable for a widower to have relations with any other man a few days later after this wedding when the newly married woman came to know about her husband's previous relationship with his sister in law the woman actually committed suicide the woman's family lodged an fir against the brother in law and the wood widowed woman and they and they were both sentenced to prison ultimately uh, in this matter not only um, the lives of the three people involved but also those associated with them was destroyed or adversely affected what is the crime of the woman who fell in love with her brother in law after her husband's death who should be held responsible for this in majority cases um, marriages in india are a means to control women's body and choices uh, without the explicit permission of the parents a woman cannot marry outside of her caste or religion in fact premarital affairs are frowned upon by society i met a few such women who were in love before they were married off as per their parents uh, choices in one case when the husband came to know of the woman woman's previous affairs he began assaulting her one day in self defense the woman killed her husband with a heavy object now the husband's family lodged an fir stating that the wife killed her husband so that she could live with her lover so she was sent to prison because she had dared to love at some point in her life i also met a woman in prison who cut off uh, the penis of a man who was trying to rape her in a state of complete shock she went around displaying the object to the crowd around her this woman was actually arrested by the police and the judge uh, sentenced her to 20 years in prison all because this woman was a fruit seller on the street who had on previous occasions been seen drinking with men and willingly having uh, physical relations with men in the eyes of a feudal patriarchal society she was quote unquote a characterless woman who it seems deserved to be in prison for this act what do you think is the woman a criminal or the existing ju justice system now some women uh, as i saw in my time in prison are sold into sex work when they come to cities looking for work after initial resistance and giving in to the need to earn money women embrace this world but sex workers or the sex work industry's relationship with authorities is based on power exertion and control as well in occasional tiffs with the police the policemen exert their power and send women to prison on made up charges this creates a vicious cycle of dependency where the pimps pay for bail and they're forced to go back into sex work to pay off these loans in fact when i was in prison a group of sex workers were were sent to prison and when their bail was presented they uh, convinced a poor uh, an economically um, uh, uh, back, yeah economically sorry a poor uh, girl to enter the profession uh, with them another story was of a woman named kuntala who whose drug addict husband had been sent to jail she was living a normal life with her children and mother in law bearing all responsibilities of course of the household with her children her husband was admitted to a hospital when he fell ill in prison kuntala was forced to go to hospital to take care of him again because in a patriarchal society it is considered the ultimate duty of every wife to serve her serve her husband as soon as the husband recovered he ran away from the hospital and kuntala was sent to jail on the charges of aiding in his absconding there are many women like kuntala who have not committed any crime 
but are languishing in prison. All these examples I have cited are of women who did not necessarily have a mens rea or a criminal intention to commit a crime. Their socioeconomic situation or the gendered expectations of a feudal patriarchal society drove them to commit these acts that are considered a crime in our law books. In fact, such conditions can push anybody towards incarceration. These instances that I have narrated are examples of women who wanted to transform their lives and perhaps break the patriarchal hold in their lives. If we were to remove the curtain from these so-called crimes, we would reach the conclusion that the real culprit is the social system that has pushed these women towards taking these actions. This feudal patriarchal society has created such moral values which keep women imprisoned, firstly in an invisible prison, and when they try to get out of it, they are usually declared, declared a criminal and sent behind bars. In fact, when judges pronounce their verdicts in courts on the alleged crimes of these women, they completely ignore the conditions and social order that pushes people to commit the alleged crime. It is not a stretch to say that in pronouncing a sentence in open court, judges and the justice system are guilty of creating and propagating the conditions of crime in our society. Shouldn't courts hold accountable uh, the people who actually take advantage of the system which is based upon exploitation and not those who are cursed to live in such a system? Political activist Angela Davis, who questions the entire concept of prisons, says prisons should not exist. They are not capable of reducing crime in society because there are many factors that give rise to crime in our society. So, la so long as this exploitative system continues to prosper, crimes will continue. Since jails are, institution, are an institution created by an exploitative feudal patriarchal caste and class system, it serves to further increase the exploitation of marginalized sections of society. That is why women's jails are a journey from domestic jails to jails of the establishment. And the jails of the establishment are a space for punishment and confinement of women who try to break the barriers of these domestic jails. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Seema and, and Shailsa. Um, so before we take Q&A, I want to give time for SM Rodriguez to present. Um, SM has a class to teach very soon. Um, and then we can take Q&A, uh, but please bear in mind, we have only 15 minutes remaining in this session. Hi all, um, thank you so much for your work, Seema. And I, I, I think it's brilliant and it just set off so many thoughts um, that I have uh, about prisons altogether. And I just, I'm, I'm grateful to share this space with you. Um, and thank you, Shelsa, for, for your interpretation, because obviously I wouldn't have understood it without that. <laughs> um, so um, I, I'm actually sharing a very different um, kind of body of work than I uh, normally would. And uh, rather than it being directly connected to uh, my abolitionist praxis um, or community organizing, which I will talk about tomorrow evening if any of you want to join. Um, this is actually based on an interview-based project that I um, began in 2017. Um, it's uh, based on interviews with 30 abolitionist identified academics uh, working in universities throughout the world. Um, predominantly pulling from uh, uh, seven countries. And um, this chapter is on um, emotional labor. And so I'm, I'm actually going to just read a snippet of that and um, then I'll leave it there and uh, let you know how the chapter develops. Um, 
pretty briefly. <laughs> okay, so the classroom with all its limitations remains a location of possibility. In that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality, even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries, to transgress. This is education as a practice of freedom. That's a quote from Bell Hooks in 1994. Abolitionist academics who bring abolition into the classroom are teaching to transgress, the title of the book um, that Bell Hooks wrote. Quite literally in the service of and freedom, uh, service of and hope for freedom. As scholar activists engage in hope work, work that stems from passion and vision for a just world, they must navigate the additional hidden toll of emotional labor, a quote unquote third shift. Scholars who have mapped out the experiences of scholar activism have highlighted the burden of emotional labor, especially as it takes a disproportionate toll on feminized scholars and women, the untenured and adjunct faculty and scholars of color. What I found in my interviews um, is that emotional, as emotional labor relates to abolition in the academy, those who experience personal histories of criminalization are especially vulnerable to a disproportionate burden of emotional labor. Um, and within my work, this was coded as proximity to criminalization, either because um, that person had been incarcerated at some time, um, had traumatic experiences with police or policing, um, or that they have loved ones who are incarcerated. Um, that is, although the, all of the interviewed activists are emotionally, emotionally invested to some degree in the work to progress toward a non-punitive society, not all are affected to the same degree. So um, emotional labor is an expectation of most professors in the classroom. The term describes a form of work traditionally um, that in any way requires the management of emotional experience of the worker or the customer. And while there are no traditional customers in a classroom, scholars agree that the student professor dynamic reproduces that of a client laborer in a few ways. Notably, students not only pay an ever increasing sum for education, but they also exercise a degree of choice over whose courses they take. Emotion plays a considerable role in the digestion of information Therefore, professors are charged with emotional labor as they try to elicit emotion in people with whom they interact and manage their own emotional expression according to conduct rules and ethical codes that accompany teaching and assessing students. When comprehensively accounted, the uh, amount of emotional labor undertaken is often uh, gendered, racialized, and influenced by the job security of the instructor. Our criminal justice system simultaneously relies on feelings rather than fact to reconstitute itself. For example, does the middle class feel safer than insert date is a radically different question than is the middle class experiencing or reporting less violence than said date. Um, the various moral, moral panics generated around criminality work to ensure that fear, anger, and disgust sit at the top of public consciousness at all times. Therefore, when we get, engage abolition in the classroom, we meet such feeling in real time. As Jesse Lee Jackson and Erica Miners recall in their classrooms, discussion of abolition arouses a dance between anger at injustice and fear or shame about personal transgressions. While students may embrace an imaginative or analytical curiosity about a just future, that embrace collides with their own cognitive dissonance when they're brought to question abolition. Yes, prisons are bad, but what about the bad people? Feelings of fear, vengeance, righteousness, and obstinance foment in the classroom. It's up to the abolitionist academic, uh, sorry, it's up to the professor to manage these emotions while also managing their own. Simultaneously, the person who identifies as an abolitionist ab academic holds their own desire to deliver a fact or reason-based lecture or discussion alongside the desire to evolve students' outlooks and sensibilities. The myth of objectivity riddles the academic field with landmines for scholar activists, passionate not only about the subject matter with which uh, that we teach, 
but also the methodologies for transmitting our messages that abolitionist academic remains very much a subject at all times. Similarly, we are more likely to treat students as people, not inherently receptive, unchanging objects meant to learn an unliving topic. The topics that we teach, alive and pressing, often agitate and confound people, contradicting sharply the worldview embedded into popular media. The objective of teaching is to arouse awareness, agency, activists. In uh, the chapter that I wrote before this chapter, I actually offer a few examples of how this activism works and how it blends the notions of outside and inside um, prisons in order to compel a connected world to action and how it generates from a place of hope and cultivates such a place in others. Uh, for this chapter, I offer how as scholar activists engage in hope work, they must navigate additional uh, hidden tolls of emotional labor. So when asked about strategies for teaching, the vast majority of participants interviewed discussed timing. When they introduced abolition as a term or um, perspective, or when they disclosed their personal politics. They also discuss the workings of abolition and how they personally do abolition with or for their students. However, a notable subset of academics interviewed discuss what kind of feelings they wish to arouse in their students and experience themselves while researching, teaching, and navigating their institutions. Therefore, to whomever initiated this line of discussion, I continued to ask the role of emotion in their work. I found the context of emotional labor striking when it was most burdensome, who engaged in this form of labor, and what forms of attachments predicated the work of feeling. What I found was, even within the group of abolitionist academics, those who experience personal histories of criminalization are especially vulnerable um, to emotional harms. And so um, there's emotional labor in relationship to students. Um, Bell Hooks really interestingly uses the language of eros and eroticism in her works. And um, she doesn't limit her interrogation to sexual interest and exchange. Rather, she reorients our uh, thinking of eros as passion. Referencing Sam Keen, she brings us to center erotic potency in the classroom um, as that which propels every life form from a state of mere potentiality to actuality. The erotic in this way is actually the kinetic force that moves our students' dissonance from mental inertia to ideological and theoretical connection or action. Then it is the, uh, it is the erotic that moves us to enact the thought. So um, while my participants don't necessarily uh, center the erotic, they do bring passion to the fore. And such passion most commonly appeared in the language of love and care. However, what I found were the forms of taxation that accompany love and care were fear, anxiety, and loneliness. Ultimately, the extraordinary amount of consideration that abolitionist scholars infuse into their teaching, research, and lifestyles has the potential to lead to burnout and, in the worst case scenario, push out of institutions. So for love and care, I'll just um, briefly kind of read uh, you know, a few examples of how people were engaging with or recalling love and care in their work. Um, Raleigh in Canada asserts that she is loving and caring of all of her students and that love and, and care in turn opens up the space of possibility for students to engage with her without fearing that she will be spiteful or retributive when they either express or expose a line of thinking of which she may disapprove. She says that th uh, it is this space that actually allows her to open up about her own political ideologies and teach from a more authentic place. Students feel that all perspectives are welcome in the class and that they don't feel alienated for their starting points or when their uh, perspective proves to be more progressive. Um, also note that I'm using pseudonyms for almost everyone uh, within this work. There are a few um, uh, participants who, who did want their names disclosed, um, but the majority um, uh, stuck to confidentiality uh, for the interviews. Um, Catherine in the UK considers love and care in various aspects of her work. She shared that for her, it means to pursue this kind of research with de decarceral principles um, and that she was thinking about how to embed love and care in the research process 
her relationship with her uh, peers and with people that she's working with collaboratively. The methodology and pedagogy that centers love, she reflects, excites her and brings her hope. She sees fostering love and care in her students and collaborators as a way to expand the emotional and empathetic responses required to change institutions of violence. For Catherine, hope work is ultimately about connection. If we can get our students and the public to hum humanize those in prison through various familiarization efforts, they can connect humaneness to basic comforts and move away from what she called little meannesses that they embrace that ultimately dehumanize the incarcerated other. That way she integrates love, the underpinning for compassion, the underpinning of compassionate politics into each aspect of her work. Nina, who works in the United States, reflects on her work as a labor of love in and of itself. Um, and for, for, that, for her, that meant multiple things. So she chooses the additional labor because she loves it. She loves the work that she does. Um, and her work inspires more love. It inspires love in others, and it inspires her um, to continue loving uh, the topic and loving people. Um, Mina believes that the goals of her work require that people become more comfortable with non-romantic expressions of and beliefs in love. And um, I'll move forward a little bit just to say that Mina's perspective really strikingly to me relates to the writings of Mekin Nagel, who uh, believes that feeling is the way forward from criminal justice. In her articulations of Ludic Ubuntu, as the antidote to hatred and vengeance, Meke uplifts the prospects that recognizing a shared humanity and asserts the need to collectively embrace the playfulness that accompanies human connection. The abolitionist imagination then centers feeling, even when those feelings leave us vulnerable to burnout or alienation. So just to really quickly move to um, the kind of rougher feelings, uh, um, anxiety and fear really showed up. And the scholars that I interviewed um, both talked about their strategies of alleviating or dealing with anxiety, which quite curiously actually led to even more work, um, but different forms of work that then kind of recentered um, their emotions. Um, but anxiety arose particularly um, for was actually exclusively for women who were interviewed when it came to being asked to be um, or believed to be spokespeople. Um, so public speaking roles and represent uh, being asked to be a representative of of like a monolithic position or experience, particularly if they hadn't experienced it themselves. Um, Lastly, with anxiety, there was significant anxiety that arose related to student evaluations. Um, and this was related largely to institutions that had led um, to evaluating or using student evaluations as the basis of whether or not people could secure teaching contracts. Um, and so as this kind of uh, you know, neoliberal university formation kind of solidified, um, there were more and more um, women who were really remarking about their, um, the anxiety of, of um, job stability, which was really interesting um, kind of inverse of many um, conversations that I had around the notion of academic freedom, which almost exclusively came up with male participants. Um, so I will just leave with um, kind of notes that isolation, loneliness, and self-doubt also were ones that came up. And that ultimately um, it was the uh, participants who identified as queer people of color who were actually most likely um, to say that the isolation um, basically transformed into push out, which is you know, a forced form of isolation, right? Segregation or being oust ousted from um, the academy. Um, but um, that there were significant responses um, by women of color who didn't um, identify as queer, um, who kind of mirrored that and said, I'm isolated, I'm, I'm in a very lonely place and I don't think I'm going to stay here anymore. And so um, I did find that it was, you know, just this interesting kind of relationship between identity and either um, uh, 
push out that was quite forceful or push out that was more um, uh, I, you know quieter uh, kind of a quiet coercion um, uh, uh, through isolation. Um, so I'll leave it there and I, I thank you all for allowing me to uh, share this work. Thank you so much, SM. Well, uh, just a time check, everyone. We're at 10.03 a.m. Pacific time, 1.03 Eastern. Um, so um, that means that our session uh, scheduled time has come to an end. However, those of you who want to stay longer, um, if, if the presenters, if I, any of the presenters are able to stay longer, um, we can do um, Q&A. Uh, so I want to check with the presenters. Uh, uh, SM, I know you have a class. So uh, are you able to stay for Q&A? I can stay for an additional five minutes. <laughs> and I thank um, you all um, for this. And uh, Seema and, and, and Salsa, um, can you stay for Q&A uh, for maybe 10 minutes uh, beyond uh, now? Yes, I'm here. I can stay. Yes. Great. And um, so participants, uh, you're welcome to, uh, I'm going to uh, unmute everyone. Or um, uh, Luis, if you could please unmute everyone. Uh, actually, I just I just asked everyone to unmute. So um, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions directly. Um, and uh, please, please direct your, your first questions to, to SM because of their schedule. Yeah. All right. Are you going? Very good. Very good too. Um, are you going to talk to the students before? I mean, are you going to reference the collective work in any way? For the future of it. Hey. All right. Hey, wait, can you guys hear me? My sound isn't funny today. Yeah. Can somebody say something so I can see if my it's, it's working? We can hear you. We can hear you. Ah, shoot. No, I can't hear you. Hold on. I got to call in instead. Okay, I'm going to mute everyone if we can, and then maybe they can just unmute uh, if and when they... Okay, if you have a question, please put a question mark in the chat and I will unmute you selectively. You can also enter your question into the chat and I'll read it out loud. Uh, there was I one think... person, Xavier, who had their hand up. Yes. yes, Xavier. Hello, SM. Thank you for your amazing presentation. And I just had a really quick question because I found it quite interesting how you mentioned emotional labor. And I easily correlated to Marxism with, you know, wage labor and such. So is it plausible to say that the whole um, idea of that emotional labor and applying it to education is more of like a micro level, I wanna say relation to Marxism within that Soren institution. Yeah, so I think the value of thinking through um, emotional labor is really to say that there are kind of additional tolls or additional um, asks of certain people that are really aligned with the values that we have um, or the lack of value that we may have in society, um, but that really reflect a lot of gendered norms. Um, and so, for example, um, there are studies that I reference within this that say that uh, women and feminized people are people who are understood to um, Kind of have additional time for emotionality right and to work through your emotions with you and there's a lot of literature out there about um other mothering and um these forms of uncompensated labor that help others um produce right and so it's it i i think that um it is really useful to kind of think through um you know burden versus production and who is uplifted within um academia um, versus who takes on a lot of additional forms of labor that then um, 
uh, really um, compromise ability to do what you're actually tasked with doing um, as a professor. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Apologies, um, the chat was was set so that that participants could only mute only uh, uh, post to the host, but you can now post to everyone in the chat. Okay, um, Madhushri has a question. Um, I wanted to ask Simaji on the role of Brahmanism, the role that Brahmanism plays in the carceral system in India. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me to may translate karu ya? Uh, please. So Madhushri ka sawal hai ki Brahmanism ka kya role hai uh, India mein jis tarah ka carceral system hai uh, jis tarah se incarceration hoti hai Brahmanism ka kya role hai usme usko aap kaise describe karengi? हाँ वो आ, मैंने अपनी जेल डायरी में इसको लेके लिखा भी है कि आ, आ, जैसी हमारी सोसाइटी है आ, आ, जेल उसका मतलब जेल में वो बिल्कुल साफ साफ दिखता है मतलब सबसे साफ साफ तौर पे वहां पे दिखता है तो क्योंकि हमारी सोसाइटी में ही एक ब्राह्मणवाद है इसलिए जेल में भी वो साफ साफ दिखता है और वो इस तरह से कई कई तरीकों से दिखता है वो ऐसे कि जैसे जेल में सबसे अधिक दलित और मुस्लिम्स हैं एक तो इस रूप में दिखता है तो ये एक मतलब जेल में उनका ज्यादा दिखना ये बताता है ये उनके प्रचार का एक तरीका बनता है माध्यम बनता है कि उनके जो जो दलित जातियां हैं उन वही ज्यादा उनके तरफ से ही ज्यादा जो है क्राइम्स होते हैं एक तो ये और जेल में के अंदर भी किस तरह से जिस तरह से ब्राह्मणवाद प्ले होता है वो उनके कामों का जो बंटवारा होता है उसमें बिल्कुल साफ साफ दिखता है जैसे तो जो दलित जातियां हैं उनको जो काम का बंटवारा होता है तो उनमें साफ सफाई का काम ज्यादा दिया जाता है और जो ब्राह्मण होता है उनको कई बार कामों से फ्री भी रखा जाता है और वो अपना जो बल्कि जो ब्राह्मणवाद नहीं मैं ब्राह्मण की बात कर रही हूँ अगर कोई पंडित है तो उसको वहां पे भी पूजा पाठ करने की और बहुत सारी तरीकों की उनको छूट दी जाती है और वहां पे भी वो अपना ब्राह्मणिकल प्रैक्टिस करते रहते हैं तो इस तरह के बहुत सारे तरीके हैं जो मतलब हमारी सोसाइटी में दिखती है वो सबसे बॉन्डे रूप में जेल के अंदर भी वहां पे दिखते हैं चल जा ओके okay. या yeah. Thank you, Seema Ji. So, uh, Seema said that um, I have described some of the elements of what the question is asking in my jail diary as well. Uh, she says that just like in our society or a, a, a smaller depiction of what the kind of oppressive systems that exist in our society are visible in jails as well at a smaller scale. Um, so, the Brahminical attitudes and the system of oppression associated with Brahminism is also depicted in the ways that, uh, you know, the carceral, carceral institutions work. Uh, for instance, uh, the overpopulation of our prisons by, you know, uh, looking at the, you know, uh, by Dalits and Muslim uh, uh, persons is an indication of how uh, the marginalized section actually is um, predisposed, uh, you know, is, is suffers at the hand of this Brahminical system and ends up in prison. Even inside jail, the way that uh, work or labor is divided inside is uh, is a depiction of how uh, oppression on caste uh, caste based oppression op oppression also uh, operates outside the jail. So, uh, you know, many uh, persons belonging to Dalit communities are assigned work uh, that is to do with cleaning toilets or cleaning the jail premises, and um, 
so called upper castes or brahmins are uh, sometimes not uh, sometimes uh, you know free from doing any work at all inside prison uh, they are granted these privileges inside prison as well in fact they are granted privileges of carrying on their religious activities or uh, duties uh, that are associated with their caste thank you Thank you, Shalza. Um, we have a question from Shweta Goswami. Hi. Um, Seema ji, in her presentation, am I audible? I'm, am I clearly audible? OK, great. So Seema ji, in her presentation, is talking about women prison to prison. And it seems like, uh, as if women is a universal category happening in India without uh, caste. Um, and uh, I think our experiences are very different. The experience of uh, Vimukta women, I would say, I wouldn't talk for Dalit women, but uh, for Vimukta women, that uh, Vimukta families, because since uh, Vimuktas are the nomadic people and they travel into groups, they used to, but. Uh, uh, let not okay. So, but I basically want to say that um, the Mukta women are have have been working, you know. So, um, the patriarchy is not working the same way it worked in the in this romanticized notion of a home. So, uh, what I felt was that this whole um, presentation somehow erased the um, erased the experience of uh, Vimukta women who are incarcerated in the Indian state since 150 years. So it just, uh, you know, the whole conversation being limited to Dalit Muslim and also talking about sex workers without saying that, uh, without acknowledging that sex work has, uh, was again, forced on certain communities within Vimukta communities. So and then talk about occultism or shamanic cultures saying that they it, it, it's a, at, man, at many levels it seemed like uh, you know it wasn't informed with the lives of people outside the caste system and those people are women of the people so yeah i just uh, want to Ask like why, why, and how long should this kind of erasure continue? <laughs> Especially like I'm while I'm talking, I'm literally shaking. I don't know because it just feels like this, you know. Uh, in order for abolition space to be safe, it's very important that while people talking, they talk about their social location and yeah, where they're coming from and how they are talking and for whom they are talking. It's I think it's very important. So so that the abolition space can be safe and people who are participating from different communities, especially the communities that are at the receiving end of this entire system of carceral state. So yeah, that would be really nice. Uh. Okay, I'm done, thank you. Shelja, please translate. Uh, thank you, Shweta. I'm going to try and translate as much as possible, but if, if I miss out something, please uh, let me know. Um, so, Seema ji, um, uh, Shweta is saying that we are talking about this, and we are talking about the present to the present. Just... Uh, Seema ji, sunai de rahe? Hello? Shelja, please translate this question. Haan, haan. Uh, sunai de rahe aapko? Haan, ab sunai de rahe. Abhi beech mein awaaz chali gai thi. Okay. So, uh, uh, Shweta is asking that the thing about prison to prison and women's talk about the 
जिस औरत जो कैटेगरी की बात हो रही है वो ऐसा लग रहा है कि जैसे उनकी कोई कास्ट नहीं है और श्वेता अपने एक्सपीर श्वेता बात करना चाहती हैं या बात रख रही हैं विमुक्त जातियों की फैम के परिवार और औरतों की तरफ से जो कि इंडियन सोसाइटी में साउथ एशियन सोसाइटी में नोमैडिक नोमैडिक कम्युनिटीज से आते हैं और जो ग्रुप्स में ट्रैवल करते हैं या करते थे एक समय तक और पेट्रिया की शायद उस यू नो उस तरीके से उस समाज में नहीं दिखाई देती उनका एक्सपीरियंस कुछ और है और जो हम जिस तरह से या जिस तरह से ये प्रेजेंटेशन है उसमें वो एक्सपीरियंस दिख नहीं रहा है या मिटाया जा रहा है एंड और एक चीज उसमें उन्होंने ये भी नोट की कि जब सेक्स वर्क की भी बात होती है तो ये इस बात की एक्नोलेजमेंट नहीं है कि कुछ औरतों का सेक्स वर्क थोपा जाता है स्पेसिफिकली विमुक्त जाति की औरतों के ऊपर श्वेता हाँ सॉरी एंड देन उसके बाद श्वेता ने बोला कि बहुत सारे लेवल पे ऐसा लग रहा था सुन के कि ये प्रेजेंटेशन कास्ट सिस्टम को कंसिडर करते हुए नहीं बात रख रही है और कितने समय तक ये यू नो जबरदस्ती मिटाने की कोशिश चलती रहेगी अबॉलिशनिस स्पेस जहां पर हम प्रेजेंस को खत्म करने की बात कर रहे हैं लोगों के पास सेफ्टी होनी चाहिए अपने सोशल लोकेशन से बात रखने के लिए और वो स्पेसेस भी सेफ होनी चाहिए और अलग अलग कम्युनिटीज से बात रखने की जगह और क्षमता देनी चाहिए इफ माय लाइफ ट्रांसलेशन इज नॉट एक्यूरेट एंड इफ एनीबडी वॉन्ट्स टू जम्प इन एंड provide uh, you know corrections or anything you're more than welcome to seema ji ha ha shelja uh, shweta ka jo uh, sawal hai aur sawal nahi hai unka apna uh, view bhi hai ek tarah se uh, mujhe laga ki sawal mein lekin jo sawal hai us pe jo agar main baat rakhu to to sabse pehle main jo nomadic society jo hota hai jo ghumantu samaj hai Uh, मैंने अपनी किताब में इस प्रेजेंटेशन में भले ही नहीं रखा लेकिन मैंने किताब में एक घुमंतु जनजाति जो पारदी समुदाय होती है उसका एक जो एक्सपीरियंस रखा है जेल में मुझे जिन जितने लोगों का एक्सपीरियंस हुआ ये उसका ही उसको लेकर ही ये प्रेजेंटेशन है ये लेकिन उसमें एक एक्सपीरियंस ऐसा था जो कि घुमंतु जाति थी और उस उस चैप्टर में मैंने ये लिखा है कि वो अकेली ऐसी महिला थी जो जिस महिला के बारे में लिखा हुआ है वो अकेली ऐसी महिला थी जिस पे ये जेल डायरी का जो हेडिंग है औरत का सफर जेल से जेल तक वो फिट नहीं बैठता है क्योंकि वो इस जेल में आने के पहले किसी भी घरेलू जेल में कैद नहीं थी क्योंकि वहां पर ऐसा सिस्टम है नहीं कि वो किसी महिला का घर वो जेल जैसा हो तो ऐसा है नहीं तो एक तो ये दूसरा ये कि आ, मैं अभी क्योंकि एक मतलब केवल औरतों की जेल की बात कर रही हूँ इसलिए ये बिल्कुल नहीं माना जाना चाहिए कि इसमें कास्ट औरतों की कास्ट नहीं शामिल है लेकिन जब हम आ, सिर्फ औरतों पे बात कर रहे हैं औरतों के एक जेल की बात कर रहे हैं कि जो औरतों के लिए जेल बनाई गई है तो अगर हम आ, उन पे बात करते हैं तो वो वो जो वहां पे गई हैं वो कास्ट सिस्टम की वजह से गई है उस पर भी बात हुई है की गई है लेकिन कास्ट सिस्टम की वजह से वो दूसरे मतलब बात रखी जा सकती है कि वो वहां पे गई है वो कैसे वहां पे पुलिस थाने में उस वजह से उनके साथ क्या हुआ और कैसे वो जो है जो यहाँ पे ब्राइब नहीं कर पाए उनको और उस तरह से जेल में भेज दिया गया लेकिन मेरा फोकस पूरी बातचीत का केवल यहाँ पे ये था कि कैसे एक पेट्रियार्कल सोसाइटी पेट्रियार्कल सिस्टम के कारण से औरतें जेल में जा रही हैं और मेरे साथ जो विश्व विजय की जेल डायरी है उसमें इस बात का भी बहुत आ, आ, मतलब बहुत विस्तार से और मतलब ठीक ठाक तरीके से ये बात भी है कि कैसे जो है दलित लोगों के साथ वहां पे बिहेवियर मतलब जेल के अंदर कैसा व्यवहार भी किया जाता है और कैसे उनका जेल पहुंचना ज्यादा क्यों बढ़ जाता है और बीच में किसी ने उसमें चैट में मुस्लिम कम्युनिटी के लिए भी बोला तो निश्चित तौर पे वो लोग जेल में इसीलिए पहुंचते हैं क्योंकि जो सिस्टम के जो पार्ट है 
पुलिस व्यवस्था और जो न्याय व्यवस्था ये सब जो पार्ट है उसके उनका माइंड सेट अपना जो इतना ज्यादा ब्रह्मणिकल है उसकी वजह से भी वो वहां पे पहुंच जाते हैं क्योंकि उन, उनके दिमाग में ऐसा है कि ये तो बिल्कुल उपेक्षा के पात्र है इनको वहां पे जाना ही चाहिए और जब मैं आ, आ, औरतों के बीच में कास्ट सिस्टम की जब हम बात कर रहे हैं तो निश्चित तौर पे आ, ये मिटाने की बात नहीं है इसको आ, अंडरलाइन करने की बात है कि क्योंकि औरतें भी इसी कास्ट सिस्टम का पार्ट है इसलिए उनके अंदर भी एक तरह की कास्ट की हायर की पूरे तौर पे जेल में दिखती है जो जिस मैं महिला की बात कर रही थी जिसको बच्चा नहीं हो रहा था वो दलित जातियों में भी सबसे नीचे जाति की थी इसलिए उसके साथ जो दलित जाति की औरतें हैं वो भी उससे बहुत बुरा बर्ताव करती थी और जो ओबीसी जाति की जो वहां पे है ओबीसी दलित और ब्राह्मण वहां पे साफ साफ बिल्कुल जाति के आधार पर लोगों का रिकोगशन बिल्कुल साफ साफ था लेकिन ऐसा आपको पता नहीं क्यों लग रहा है कि इसको मिटाने की कोशिश की जा रही है निश्चित तौर पे जब हम इस पे फोकस करके बात करेंगे तो फिर ये सारी चीजें भी आनी चाहिए और ये एक रियलिटी है तो आपने अच्छा किया इसको चिन्हित किया ताकि इस पे भी बात सो सकी इसके लिए आपको थैंक यू um we do have we are running super late and we have to prepare for the keynote in less than 7 minutes so if it's possible to redirect um and just uh hang on tight and hold this conversation and we'll try to find space to continue it thank you